It is Sunday, April 23rd, and we are live on Ancient Faith Radio. Christ is risen! We took a little break for Pascha and Holy Week, and here we are back in the beautiful light of Pascha. And I pray that all of you had a wonderful, bright week. Um, we are here on Everyday Orthodox. I should say I'm Elisa. I'm Elisa Bielitich Davis. And uh, we get together here on Sunday nights to get to know everyday Orthodox Christians with sort of a grassroots effort to build unity through conversation. You know, I figure Orthodox unity doesn't just have to be about bishops and jurisdictions, right? It could just be about Orthodox brothers and sisters loving one another and knowing one another. And uh, that sort of unity is very achievable. So let's do that. <laughs> but uh, So we're here tonight. We've got Matushka Trudy Richter engineering the program and taking your calls. And uh, you can call in, I should say, at one eight five five af radio Can you see how rusty I am? My goodness, I'm all goofy. one 237 2346 af radio So you're always welcome to call in and talk to our guest. And, you know, you can find our show. Of course, it's always archived as a podcast. And I know a lot of our listeners listen later. But we are also live on Ancient Faith on the app and the website. And tonight we are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. You just go look for Ancient Faith Radio or Ancient Faith Ministries, and you'll find us streaming live all over the place. It's actually hard to avoid us once you start looking around. But uh, tonight we have a wonderful guest. I'm really excited, actually, to finally get a chance to talk to her a little bit because uh, we email a little bit. We're on social media with each other a little bit because our guest actually works with uh, one of our Orthodox publishers with Park End Books. So I, I always get to see her there. But uh, so our guest is named Katie or Catherine Ritsky. And Catherine's blessed to be the wife of Daniel and the mother of four children. And I have to say, you know, kudos to her because her four children are currently six and under. So she has four little ones, which is as those of you who've had big families or even small families or just ever met a little kid know, it is exhausting physically, right? Like later it's more emotional, but, but when they're little, it's pretty physical. But uh, she's a reader. She loves reading. She reads children's literature and adult literature. And uh, she has become a writer as well. So her passion for education and almsgiving and prayer has produced her beautiful first book, which is called God's Saintly Friends. And uh, I'm excited to talk about her book. She is actually at Holy Apostles Orthodox Mission in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And she's the church school director there. She's the founder of their nursery program. And she's an adjunct professor of history at WKU, which I think is Western Kentucky University, but we'll have to confirm that with her. Don't quote me on it quite yet. But uh, she's really she's really wonderful, as you can already imagine from that description. But um, let's introduce her right now. Catherine, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to it. Oh, it is really great to have you because, uh, as I mentioned, you and I kind of interact back and forth here and there a little bit because you've been working with Park End Books as well. Are you still working with Park End? Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm currently, because I've taken on a full-time job um, as a university professor, yeah. <laughs> more of a consultant uh, currently uh, for Park End, um, and I still do some social media, and we're going to start up interviews again uh, for Park End Books this summer. So be looking wow. ahead for those. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I wondered. I thought, how are you doing all of this? My like, <laughs> goodness, it's a lot. It's so much. But okay, so I want to hear your story from the beginning. Like, where were you born? Where does your story start? Sure. <clears throat> well, my story starts uh, in the swamps of Leesburg, Florida, <laughs> um, where I was born. And I, and I really do mean swamps. Um, I grew up living on a lake where we frequently had um, what my brother and I named Scarface living under mm -hmm. our back deck, which was a 13-foot alligator. Oh, um, no. And so I, when I say swamps, I truly mean it. <laughs> Were you terrified of that alligator? Or was it just like he's just always there? No. It hurts anybody. Right. No big deal. Right. No, but because, well, we had a fence in the backyard, and then, but he was under the deck. Um, that was kind of, you know, a step down from the back um, uh, kind of this yard. This is the stuff nightmares are made of. <laughs> are you I me? know. I know. Oh but gosh. I guess when it's just around you all the time, you you just learn to respect, 
you know, their space and be conscious when you're riding your bike. Like I remember um, my parents saying, you know, if you see one on the road down at this certain area, just turn your bike around and come back home and, you know, don't, don't go close to it. So I guess we just kind of got used to that. That's so amazing. But you do see videos, right? Like on social media, you'll see videos where people are in Florida and they're walking along and they're like, look at this huge gator in the road. And it's just like, my goodness, I, it's hard to imagine getting used to that. But then we all get used to whatever weird dangers mm-hmm. are around us, I suppose. <laughs> like, yes. But I mean, I would not approach, flexible. no, I would not approach a big, a big gator for a social media video. <laughs> I would right? still not do I that. Mean, <laughs> It does seem like this is a better time to be moving away, my oh, friend. Don't worry about yes. the viral videos. Like, exactly. Uh, oh, my goodness. Okay, so you had a brother who named the alligator Scarface. And uh, yes. what, did you have just the one sibling or did you have more than one? Yes, I just I just grew up with an older brother. He's two years older than I am. Oh, that's fun. That's really fun. Okay, so what were your parents like? Did they always live in Florida or had they moved there? Or like, what was your family? Like? Yeah. So my dad, um, even though he was born in Tennessee on his mother's side, I am sixth or seventh generation Floridian. And so other than my dad being born in Tennessee for, I think, two years, my grandmother lived out of state and then came back. But she was born in Nocatee, Florida, which is kind of close to Lake Okeechobee. And then both her mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother were all born in Florida. And so that's actually kind of rare um, yeah, to have that many people born yeah. and to be Florida natives. Oh, that's, that's so, kind of neat. Yeah. And then my mom uh, grew up in Arkansas, but her parent, her dad was a Church of Christ preacher. And so they moved very frequently. And after she went to college, um, her parents retired in Florida. And so that's kind of how both of my parents ended up in the, kind of the same area. They were, were both teachers. Um, and so then, yeah, I, I spent my whole life until college in Florida. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it is rare because I was going to say like most Floridians, we always think people tend to move from the Northeast down to Florida, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. Florida is filled right. with transplants. Um, so that's, that's kind of, it sort of makes sense that you have both in your family. Yes. Well, and I did the opposite. Now I'm much further north. <laughs> that's right. That's absolutely right. Okay. So did you always live, like when you say in the swamps, if it was wet, was it also a small town or was it kind of a, a suburb? Yeah. Or- yeah. So I lived kind of in a, in rural central Florida. So we were about 45 minutes west of Orlando and about 30 minutes east of Ocala. So kind of right in the very middle of what's called Central Florida. And so that region has lots and lots of lakes, um, lots of swamps too, and wildlife and boating and fishing and um, all of that kind of thing. Um, It's right also very close to the Ocala National Forest. So you also have kind of that very, um, not very populated area, but then the town where I went to school was kind of a conglomerate of the surrounding kind of rural areas came together where the schools were. Okay. That makes sense. That's neat though. It's, I mean, it is really that area of Florida. I have a friend who lives North of Orlando. So we've driven like from there over to Clearwater, Mm -hmm. we've driven over to St. Augustine. And so that whole like sort of band of central Florida right there, it is jungle. Like it's just, it's amazing and it's beautiful. And I remember when she moved to Florida, I was thinking like the most dangerous thing she might face might be an iguana. And they were like, oh no, you have to watch out for bears and you have to watch out for this and that. She's got everything. Like it's amazing the wildlife there. Do you miss that not being in Florida anymore? Or is it kind of a relief to be away from? Because I mean, it's, it's a lot of wildlife and it's very, very beautiful, but it's not safe exactly, right? It's right. all dangerous wildlife. Yeah. I think one of the things that was appealing to me about where I live now is, or the, were the changing of the seasons. And so Florida is just so oppressively hot and humid <laughs> for most of the year. You might get a break from late October to February but even then, you might have days in the 80s, which, I mean, for some people is is great. 
Um, and certainly when we're getting to the end of February and into March where we live and it's still cold, my husband and I are like, mm, yeah, we probably need to be in Florida <laughs> instead of this forever winter. <laughs> um, and so I do miss the lakes. Um, where we live, there are, you know, creeks and there are actually quite a few lakes about 30 minutes from here. But I do miss uh, the water. Yeah. So I'm in um, South Central Kentucky, uh, kind of close to the Tennessee line, actually. So even though our local parish is in Bowling Green, Kentucky, um, I live in Franklin, which is right um, just a few miles from Tennessee, actually. Okay. Okay. Well, neat. Well, yeah, I mean, you really have moved from one like heavily wooded place to another, ultimately, mm -hmm. right? Like it's yes. still, you still have all the trees. Still very rural. Beauty. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, are you're still rural, huh? It's still a small Yes. Okay. Yes. That's neat. Okay. Well, so, okay. So tell me about yourself as a kid. What were you like? What did you like to sure. do as a kid? Well, I love to be outside. Um, I love to be outside and I love to sing. Um, and so my mom said that I actually sang before I talked. Um, and uh, each summer, because my teachers, my teachers, my parents were teachers, um, they had the summers off. And so we would go camping all over the United States. And so that was always a really big part, both of my childhood. And then that bled into my kind of adult adventures was travel. So I would definitely say, you know, being outdoors, I've been in choir since I was a very young age, um, and exposed to lots of different kinds of music from my parents, um, also. So I would say, you know, a, a young Katie would be probably, uh, skinned, need, slightly dirty, <laughs> um, <laughs> child with lots of flowers and singing through the swamps, I guess would be the picture I would paint. <laughs> And now one of your grandparents was Church of Christ. So did you grow up in uh -huh. Church of Christ? I did. I did. Um, both sides of my family um, growing up were Church of Christ. And my wow. one grandfather was a preacher. And then, um, but the other side was also that. And that's how my parents um, met, um, was going to the same church. Um, and so, yeah, so I grew up, up de definitely in the Church of Christ. And were you growing up in the same parish, like where your parents had grown up and met or like, was um, it like just all yeah, old it, school? It was like the everybody same, forever's been in that place. It was the same church where they met, but they had both moved to Leesburg from other cities ah, okay. in Florida. So not where they grew for up. For teaching jobs. Yeah. Not, not where they grew up. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That's, that's neat though. Okay. So, okay. So you grew up Church of Christ. Were you mm -hmm. like really active in the church as a kid? Did you, did you like it a yes. lot? Or, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, in fact, I went to a Church of Christ summer camp um, in Florida uh, every single summer from the time I was eight until I was actually in college. And then I served as a counselor at that same camp. Um, and so I was very much involved, um, especially with youth. And then um, I ended up going to a private Church of Christ college for my first two years that was associated with that summer camp. Oh, wow. Okay. So what, uh, what were you studying in college? And just, and I guess also just, you know, as you're making that decision to go to college, what did you picture yourself doing? What did you think you were going to want to do? Who did you think you were? You know what I mean? Like, like sometimes yeah. that changes dramatically after we get there. So what, what who were yes. you before you went and, uh, and did that stay constant? Sure. Well, before I went, I think I always had an interest in teaching and probably due to the fact that both my parents were teachers. So I was used to, to kind of that schedule and that um, opportunities to teach others and working with, like I always volunteered to help teach the younger Bible classes and things like that. Um, and so I think going into college, um, Partially, I kind of wanted to have fun and just explore, you know, being an adult. But then I also, because I was going to a private Church of Christ school, I knew that, you know, faith and religious-based teaching would be a big part of that. And I actually started out as a music major, um, vocal performance. And so I think originally I thought I was going to maybe be some kind of music teacher, um, but, but ultimately things kind of went a different path for, for that. Okay. 
Okay. So why did they go a different path? What well, happened? I found out that I got extreme anxiety <laughs> before performances. Oh, no. Wait, did you and, not know that before? Had you never, were you a music no. major who had never performed before anyone? I was That's a music amazing. major, yeah, who hadn't performed solo uh, concerts or performances often. And so I had usually been singing in a group or if I was singing in a solo situation, it was like in a musical, not oh. a um, concert where it was just myself and a piano with, oh, you know, okay. I could see everyone in the audience. There was no spotlight. And I just came to, to think, um, I also had a vocal teacher who really wanted me to be a high soprano. And I was convinced that I was not that. <laughs> and so I would just get this anxiety of, I'm not going to hit this note or I'm not going to, this isn't going to sound quite right. And so, um, so yeah, it just didn't, it kind of took the fun out of singing for me for a while. And yeah, I, I just decided, well, this is not really for me, but I had this really amazing history professor and I thought, well, this is, you know, I've always been really interested in, in history, probably linking back to traveling. Um, because when we would go camping, my dad's parents would come with us and we would go to like all the ranger talks and we would go to Mesa Verde and these other archaeological sites. And so I had already been exposed to kind of all this American history. Um, and and I, and I think when I took that class and I had a very dynamic history professor, um, that that kind of sparked something in me. And I thought, oh, well, I'm obviously going to be a history professor now. And so I really kind of switched gears my sophomore year of college. Wow. Well, and you also changed schools shortly thereafter, right? Yeah. As a junior, I transferred to Western Kentucky University. Um, and for, for a moment, I thought I was going to do a double in archaeology and history, um, mostly because of Indiana Jones. <laughs> but then I took an archaeology fair, course. Most right. archaeologists in the current age are probably inspired by Indiana Jones. Right. I mean, because obviously that's, what, that's how archaeology works. Yeah, you know, you that's do what all it's those like. things. Right. That's what it's like. You, yeah. You're yeah. trying to outrun the Nazis and grab the good stuff exactly. and bring it to a museum. And find now treasure, also is funny, right? Because he's like, this belongs in a museum. And you're like, well, does it? I mean, is that right? Like, are you taking it to England? Like, what are you doing? But it's all yes. it's so funny. It, it all looks different 20 and 30 years later. But... Yes, it does. <laughs> um, and so, so what happened? But I, you didn't become yeah. indie at all? <laughs> I, well, I, I guess not yet. Maybe, maybe someday. <laughs> There's still room. I like There's still a chance. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, it's really true, though. There, you never know what's around the corner. <laughs> yeah, you don't. Um, Any day now. You don't. Um, <laughs> and so I took some archaeology classes, and it just, you know, it didn't click. It's a lot more science oriented than I realized. Um, and I was a lot. I took an anthropology class along with. Um, um, the archaeology class and I was just so fascinated by the description of different cultures and and belief systems and um and so I really kind of latched more onto the the anthropology side than the archaeology side um but I definitely was also enjoying my history courses um but because I had um taken all those biblical courses at the private church of Christ college um, I found out that I could double major in religious studies. So I actually ended up getting a bachelor's degree that was a double major in religious studies and history. Oh, neat. Okay. That's very neat. Now, so when you were in college, you're, you're thinking pretty sure you're going to be a professor, right? Which you are. So there mm -hmm. you go. Like that's so yeah. rare that people actually decide yes. to be what they're going to be. That's fantastic. But uh, so that was the plan. Were you thinking that you wanted to get married and have kids? What were you thinking? Yes. Yes. That was, yeah, that was also, um, well, people always joked the private school that I went to was, you know, where women went to get their MRS degree. Ah, okay. And so, you know, the plan was to meet, you know, some 
other Church of Christ person and and have a family and but also do teaching on the side or you know um, be a teacher but then also yes get married and have kids that was definitely always uh, because I enjoyed kids so much um, both from teaching you know Bible classes and also volunteering at um, the summer camp every summer um, so I always wanted to work with kids too in fact my mom said at a very young age I would ask her to babysit the babies at church because I wanted to play with them <laughs> um, because I wanted to babysit, but I was too young. <laughs> and so from, from, yeah, Love from that. a young age, I always loved children and I always Smart. loved working with children. Um, and obviously being a history professor, that's a different age group. Yes, sadly. Um, that is and so I've kind of, I've always loved the whole range of children. Um, but That's don't nice. tell my college students that I call them children. <laughs> yeah, no, no, they're not children. They're <laughs> definitely full-grown adults. Oh, Ask my. any of them. They know all of it. But yes. um, so tell me, you know, I happen to absolutely love summer camp myself. So I want to hear, like, what did you love about camp? What was it that made you decide to go back and be a counselor? And, and it's part of your inspiration for teaching. Like, what was mm-hmm. it about camp that was special to you? I think it was because of where I grew up, because it was so rural and our local church was so small, um, it was really kind of limited the other kids my age. Um, So both in my neighborhood growing up, um, my brother and I were typically the only kids because Florida is such a retirement center. Um, It just happened that our neighborhood was mostly retired people who, you know, might have grandkids visit for the summer, but consistently it was just my brother um, and me playing, um, not a big group of other kids that you might imagine in a large neighborhood. And then also um, at our church, the most of the other kids were my cousins. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the opportunities to meet other kids who maybe shared my religious beliefs or um, kind of ideals uh, was was kind of limited to the summer camp experiences. So I think that was part of it. And then I just, I always loved crafts. I'm a craft person. And so I took all the crafting classes that I could. Oh, there you go. That's cool. That's very neat. And so, okay, so you love summer camp. You love all these things. You're going to school. Did you meet your husband in college, like with the MRS degree and all of that? Or did you eventually find him later? So this one's kind of fun. So he (laughs) was in college and I wasn't a professor. Oh, no. (laughs) But he was not my student. I want to make it clear that he was not my student. (laughs) Um, So my husband is younger than I am by a few years. And so I had, um, (laughs) I had already graduated with my master's degree and the university immediately asked me right after graduation, will you teach these courses, please? And so I was 24 years old, 26, 26 years old teaching, um, college courses. And that's um, a young professor. That is very, yeah. And that was an experience too. (laughs) I'm <laughs> sure. But it's and, hard uh, when you're just barely out of that age group yourself, right? Like it's yes. hard to, it's yeah. hard to well, they, they looked at me like a, to not right, feel like exactly. a buddy. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that was, um, yeah, kind of right out of grad school into teaching. Um, and so then my husband um, grew up Serbian Orthodox, but there was no Orthodox church in rural Kentucky anywhere close to where we lived. Um, and so he, you know, his parents would take him to Orthodox churches, um, in Pittsburgh when they went to visit family or in Louisville when they would go for Pascha and the nativity. Um, and so when an Orthodox mission was formed in Bowling Green and I was a founding member of that, so we kind of skipped over my conversion to orthodoxy. Yeah, we're going to have to go um, back to that, but you can finish yeah. the story first. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I, in fact, was friends with his older sister and I knew his mom because she was going to these 
Bible studies because she wanted an Orthodox mission here too. And I was a convert um, and was supporting the mission being formed here. Um, So actually, my mother-in-law likes to say, tell people that I was her friend first. (laughs) <laughs> before I even met her son. Um, I don't know so, that's even worse, right? Like, oh, so you're dating not only a student, but your friend's son. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, well, what's funny is she, because I was a little bit older, when her son started coming um, to the mission, once it was formed, um, she would come up to me and say, you know, Katie, set Daniel up with this girl who was his age. Or, oh, Katie, can you see if Daniel will talk to this girl who is also his age? And so I ended, I actually was talking to my now husband because I was trying to help his mom play matchmaker <laughs> for these other girls. But come to find out, he was interested in me, not these other girls. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and so... Um, Meanwhile, my mother-in-law is praying to St. Xenia that for both myself and her son to find a spouse oh. without, without <laughs> connecting Xenia's the like, dots. Well, this is easy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Without connecting the dots that, oh, they're going to find each other. No um, way. And oh, so when fantastic. he, yeah. So when he asked me on my first date, I thought a hundred percent that his mother put him up to it. Like, oh, she's just, you know, making the rounds of... <laughs> Okay, now he's going to ask Katie out. Right, next. And, um, <laughs> right. And, um, but it was the best date I had ever been on. I just laughed. Be- I think because I was comfortable and I wasn't even thinking of it as a date. I thought it was just like, oh, this is Denise setting up, you know, her son, whatever. Um, and so, but for some reason, before I went on the date, I told my roommate, I said, if this goes well, I kind of think I might marry this person. And apparently my husband had told his roommate the same thing, that if this date goes well and she says she'll date me again, then I'm going to marry her. And so it was a very fast kind of, we went on the date and that was that. And we It's almost engaged. like you kind of knew subconsciously, but didn't really get it consciously. Right. You know, like right. you weren't really yes. taking it seriously, but at some level you were like, well, this would obviously be a perfect match, but it's probably not. So I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> like, yes. Yes. I think you're right. Oh, that's a um, great story. That's amazing. Yeah. That's and absolutely so we'll, amazing. We'll be married for nine years uh, in May. So. Wow. 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 I love that out. story. My goodness. All right, well, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we are going to back up a little bit and try to understand how this nice Church of Christ girl got mixed in with all these <laughs> Serbian Orthodox people. <laughs> when they're, I, and, and how amazing that you converted. I'm always extra blown away by people who convert to Orthodoxy when there's not a convenient parish nearby. So I cannot wait to hear your story. But uh, so sure. we'll be right back in just a moment. And just to remind our callers, if you have any questions, you're welcome to call in at one eight five five AF Radio. That's one eight five five two three seven two three four six, and we'll be right back. Everyday Orthodox with Elisa Bielitich Davis will be back in a moment. Give Elisa and her guest a call at eight five five two three seven two three four six. That's eight five five AF Radio. For all of us, male or female, parent or not. That's what it's often like, isn't it? It's at the end of our own tether that the miracle happens. It is in our greatest weakness that God's strength is known. It's when we decrease that He can increase. It's in losing our life that we find it. To put it another way, it's in the spot where St. Morwenna falls down, exhausted that her spring rises up. It's when the people of God curse Moses in the wilderness and wish themselves back in Egypt that they hear the crack of the staff, the gush of water through the rock. It's when God himself is spat upon and mocked and bleeding and dead that the glorious resurrection is ushered in. From Seven Holy Women, Conversations with Saints and Friends, now available as an audiobook at Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. We're back with Everyday Orthodox with Elisa Bielitich Davis. Do you have a question for Elisa and today's guest? 
Call in now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Here again is Elisa. And welcome back to Everyday Orthodox. I'm Elisa Bielitich Davis, and we're here tonight with Catherine Ritsky. And Catherine is the author of the new book, God's Saintly Friends. And we're going to talk all about that book. But first, we are going to rewind a little bit and try to figure out how this wonderful girl raised in the Church of Christ and very happy with her faith found herself becoming Orthodox and trying to get a mission going in Bowling Green, <laughs> Kentucky. Like, what? how did you even hear about Orthodoxy? Sure. Um, well, I'll have to, to drop uh, Father Daniel Greeson's name. Um, who's also at St. Anne's, um, Father Stephen Freeman. I heard the commercial at the beginning. Um, Father Daniel is at that parish, um, and he and I went to the same Church of Christ school, um, along with a couple other um, college students. We all transferred to Western Kentucky University because they had a, um, what is it called, a tuition incentive that if you transferred from this private college to Western, you could receive in-state tuition. And so a lot of us went up to WKU. um, And while I was in college, my parents divorced and I felt like I wanted to go somewhere new. I didn't want to stay in Florida. Um, I wanted to kind of maybe try living somewhere different. And so when I came up here, Um, I actually started attending a community church that still had a lot of my Church of Christ friends who had also transferred, um, including Father Dan. But he was kind of, he was about a year or two years ahead of me. I think he was already a catechumen, perhaps, at a, um, a mission in Nashville. And so he, because we still hung out together with some of our other mutual friends, um, invited me and said, Hey, why don't you come down with me and our friend Cole to this mission in Nashville and just see what it's like. And of course, prior to that, you know, I'd had kind of a a long conversation with him just about, you know, history and how does history relate to the church of Christ? And, you know, what is the continuity of the faith in our, from our beliefs, And so that's, I think, why he invited me to go. And I just remember it was, I think it was a small, maybe Rocorn mission um, in Nashville that was in um, one of the library rooms of Vanderbilt College. And so we went in this very historical building up the stairs and we came around a corner. And I remember looking into this very small room and they had a, an iconostasis and a small chandelier and the whole room was only lit by candles. And I just remember having this just overwhelming feeling of holiness. And I remember, um, I think someone handed me kind of a, a liturgical guide that also had some of the hymns in it. And I remember singing and afterwards, the person who'd been standing in front of me was like, oh, how long have you been, you know, Orthodox? What brings you here? And I said, oh, no, this is my first time (laughs) in an Orthodox church. And they said, oh, well, you sing so well. And I said, oh, well, you know, I can read music. And he said, well, we need chanters, you know. (laughs) That's so presumptuous. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I said, well, I'm not Orthodox. And just from there, I think that that experience of holiness and the music was very beautiful and the service was unlike any religious service I had ever participated in. Um, and so then um, I started going to this kind of Bible study at um, Kevin and Jeanette Burt's house um, in Bowling Green. And um, there were a lot of college students and there were a few other, I think there were some other Orthodox people that were attending from fairly early on because um, Father Alexander Addy, a blessed memory um, from Louisville, had come down to kind of recruit, like, okay, we have we have some Protestant converts who converted to Orthodoxy in Nashville, but now we want to try to bring in anyone who's, who is Orthodox in the region to join and help. And so Father Addy is actually the one that called my mother-in-law, Denise, 
So from very early on, I think even before our first official liturgy in Bowling Green, uh, my mother-in-law was at that Bible study on Tuesday nights. And that's, um, well, that's yeah. how you get a mission parish going, right? Like you have to get everybody yes. kind of together regularly and then slowly cultivate that community. And wow. Yeah. That's... So we, we started doing readers vespers on Tuesday evenings. Um, and then um, one, I remember one evening, uh, Father Addy and I think Bishop Mark was over us at the time. Um, called and said, you know, we need you guys to pick a name for this potential mission. And one of the young men who was there looked around and said, well, there's 12 of us. It should be Holy Apostles. Oh, that's cool. And um, Father, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Bishop Mark said, that's amazing because that's actually the name that I was going to propose to you all. Wow. Oh, so neat. I think it was meant for us to be yeah. Holy Apostles. You know what? I mean, so. missions, missions take shape like that. You know, like mm -hmm. we had a mission here in town and I remember I had thought, you know, well, I would, I would, they should name it St. Luke because that was our Slava saint and that was my son's name. And I was just like, mm -hmm. it should be St. Luke. And the priest comes and he's like, well, I really want it to be St. Sava. And I sent in a request to the bishop and he said, absolutely not. It's St. Luke. And he's like, I don't know where that came from. I was wow. Like, oh, sorry, I was praying for that. But, <laughs> but now it's St. Luke's Serbian Orthodox Church. You know, oh, that's you amazing. But uh, but no, it is. It's interesting because a lot of times in parishes, you'll have a story like that, right? Where it's mm -hmm. like two or three different people were all thinking about the same name. And so here we are. Mm -hmm. but I, out of curiosity, did your mother-in-law know Father Addy or did he just look for Serbian names in the yellow pages? Uh, the white she, yeah, she knew him because oh, okay. they would visit um, for Pascha and Nativity oh, nice. and other times of the year. My father-in-law's parents lived in Louisville, so they visited there, you know, more than twice a year even. And so she would always go to St. Michael's. Um, and so, yeah, so she knew Father Addy um, and she had she had been praying for a mission. She had been praying for something closer than Nashville or Louisville. So... I think that was very much a part of, of her mind of wanting something closer. So it made sense for him to reach out to her. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so when you went out on your first date with your husband, is Daniel, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you went out with Daniel, was there even a mission parish yet? Or was it still the Bible study? Yes. by the Yeah, by the time, because there is about six years, six or seven years between when the mission was kind of formed with the Bible study and when my husband and I went on a date. So by that time, we actually had our current property. Wow. Okay. So That's in a very cool. short time, we went from worshiping in a funeral home and a Catholic fellowship hall and um, a hotel hall to a rented facility be behind a tattoo parlor um, awesome. <laughs> then, uh, from there. So yeah, that was the first call. In fact, I was chrismated right outside the tattoo parlor in a horse trough, That's awesome. um, That's with some fantastic. other college catechumens, um, <laughs> by father Addy. And, um, but see, so, that's faith, I mean, right? Like it's one thing yeah. to walk into a big, beautiful cathedral and be like, yeah, this looks legitimate. But like, if you're willing to do that in a horse trough out behind a tattoo parlor, like that's real faith right there. <laughs> there was also railroad tracks right there. So nice. I mean, it was the whole, the oh, whole yeah. picture. Um, yeah. But oh, yeah. And your parents I, must have loved that. <laughs> the, yeah, well, yeah. When you that were was it. or no? How was that? <laughs> Was it hard? Um, I, I mean, I know for most of us, sure. it's hard on our parents when we, and just like if my kids were to convert away from Orthodoxy, mm -hmm. that would be hard on me, right? Like I get it. Yeah. Was it hard on your parents? Um, It was definitely hard for my dad because he was the one uh, who had baptized me when I was young in the Church of Christ and um, had kind of been a little more, um, well, he stayed in the Church of Christ and my mom left had already left by the time I was in college. And so she was a little more, you know, explore your own beliefs. And for him, I think it was maybe he took it a little more personally that I was doing something against kind of his wishes or his teachings. 
Um, and so I actually read, um, I think it's light from the Christian East Mm -hmm. with him before I was baptized. Um, and that helped a little bit. Um, and, and now we have a really good relationship where we speak fairly openly about religious things. Um, but it was definitely a process, um, and for both of us, um, to it is, kind it's of hard. I mean, and you can see that. now raising your kids, right? Like you're responsible yeah. oh, for absolutely. their spiritual upbringing. And mm-hmm. then it feels like they walk away. And I, you know, I often say though, that moving from Protestantism to Orthodoxy isn't walking away from the faith. It's, you know, walking into maybe a different form of the faith, you know, something with, with more of the forms that have maybe have been, you know, outmoded or whatever you want to say and you know in other forms of christianity rejected would be a hard way to say it maybe but um you know it's not a different faith in the sense that you're not walking away from christ you're walking toward christ so it's but it's hard it's hard for people and i get that i I think it was hard on my folks too but uh, i'm glad that he's made peace with it and it was probably extra hard because your mom had walked away too so it was just like oh my gosh everybody's abandoning ship (laughs) oh my goodness yes Yes, That's I think hard. he, yeah, he definitely had a, a very stressful couple of years <laughs> there bet. in a row. I so bet. God God bless him for his patience with us all. God bless him. Absolutely. That's hard. But uh, okay, so so you guys got married and it sounds like you got married pretty soon after you met. Like you guys kind of knew when that one mm-hmm. date went well, it was like, oh, well, you're the one. Is, is that what it was yeah. like? Yeah, the, I think we got, yeah, we got married the very next year. So our okay. first date was February 15th, and we got married um, May 24th of the next year. That's lovely. But when you know, you know, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So how long was it before you guys started having kids? Did you have any time to just enjoy each other at all, or did you jump right in? Or what? Uh, what We had a honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, let's see, Chloe was born, our oldest, who's now eight, and I should amend my um, bio because they're now, uh, my four kids are eight, six, four, and two. Oh, that's right. Uh, so I have an old bio. That's right. Yeah, I should have updated that. Uh, oh, that's I forgot, okay. I think. Um, well, it's probably partly because we kept postponing the show, so they might have been sick. <laughs> <laughs> we kept having to reschedule because you, like, your whole family would have the flu and then yes. I would, like, randomly go out of town or something. I don't remember what exactly yes. happened, but I know we rescheduled, so it's probably my fault. But, yes. Uh, okay, yeah, so, so, so we were married long? in yeah may of 2014 and then our oldest was born in april of 2015 yeah there you go so about, i think we were married about three months or so yeah and then and then chloe and there you go there you go yeah i mean it's a beautiful thing right like and it's intentional and you're like i'm married we're gonna have kids whatever and then all of a sudden later it's like oh we could have just like had fun for a while <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping for a early retirement. <laughs> there you go. There, well, I mean, that works, right? When you have your kids young, they grow up and you're still young. Yeah. So it works out. Yeah. It works out. Do you guys feel like four is a really good number for you? Or are you just like, I'm just going to have a lesson? Yeah, we do. Um, when we, well, when we were going through marriage counseling uh, with Father Michael Nasser, uh, who's now up at Grand Rapids. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, he, he was our first full-time parish priest in, in Bowling Green. Um, when we were going through marriage counseling with him, um, you know, one of the questions was, you know, do you want a big family or a small family? You know, what are your expectations there? And both of us had said we wanted a larger family. Um, you know, I just have a brother and then my husband has two sisters. He's in the middle. Um, and so he said he always felt outnumbered. So he said, I want an even number. Uh, Ah. my husband's also an accountant. So, you know, numbers are important in our household. Um, and so I guess four was kind of the magic number. Um, so and yeah, I'm so. with your husband. Like I have, I have opinions about numbers like, Oh, this number is mm-hmm. on a, I don't like that number. I like this number. I liked four and I liked six and I ended up with five and I was like, this is God just like messing with me. <laughs> 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 but, uh, okay. So you guys have four kids now. But you're mm-hmm. still working as a professor. Did you take a break at all? Why are you having all those babies? Or were you, have you just been professing this whole time? Well, the one, the good thing is that I was always a part-time um, professor. And so I did take 
there was a year off, I think the year we got married where I didn't teach at all because I could make more money working full time at a coffee shop to save up wow. for our wedding. Um, and so say, that's I like, did. let's just sit with that for a moment and ask yeah. yourself, like, what's the problem with education right now? <laughs> like, yeah, go, go think a teacher. about education. Like, <laughs> that's why. Because Starbucks <sighs> is better than yes. teaching. Than, like, yes. you know, yeah. Yeah, that's painful. So, that's so I had already been kind of teaching part-time and working food service. And then when we got pregnant with my daughter, at about 28 weeks, I had some complications And so I had to stop working at the coffee shop altogether because I couldn't be on my feet for that many hours. And so then after she was born, I kind of thought, well, you know, I'd kind of like to be out of food service and and push more towards um, the academics. And so I actually got a job part time at a community college um, once Chloe was, I think, five months old and and. just to add to it, we were living with my in-laws because my husband was still in school. And so we lived in their basement and my mother-in-law would watch, um, Chloe, uh, while I taught two days a week. And so because I was only teaching part-time, you know, I wasn't away for, for very long. And so when I think Chloe was about five months old, um, my mother-in-law would watch her while I taught because we also lived with them. So that was a huge blessing. It is a huge blessing. See, that's what happens when you marry a student, right? Like you got to move back right. home. You got to do all yes. that. But then there's all of the upside of that. And that's, I, you know, that's what they have in, in other cultures, right? Where people just yes, have the grandparents nearby. And the, exactly, right? They can take care of the kids. It's beautiful. So yes. I want to hear a little bit about, like, it seems like as we're discussing your whole story, There's no point where you're like, I'm going to be a children's author. And yet now you're a children's author. So how did that come about? Yeah. So that happened um, when everything shut down with COVID. Um, And I I want to say it was maybe even the second or third week um, after March of 2020. um, And I had been home on spring break because I was teaching part-time at the university again. Um, And so I had been home for spring break. And then, you know, I got the message from my university that we we were going all virtual and that we should anticipate, you know, virtual only classes in the fall. Um, And I just, I had been really thinking about social media and then the lockdowns and my children. Um, and I just kind of thought, you know, they're not going to see their friends for a little while. And I was also thinking about how social media kind of creates its own problems with friendship. And so I just kind of had this vision of friendship in my head. And I just thought how I'm also a church school director and church school teacher. So I'm constantly looking for, you know, lessons and and things to teach my church school kids. Um, And so I was thinking like, how, how do we teach about friendship to even the littlest ones? How do we prepare them for a world where it's difficult to judge true friendship and godly friendship? And I thought, you know, there's saints for everything. And when I was actually finishing my bachelor's senior thesis, um, I wrote it on St. Perpetua and St. Felicity. Um, I was taking a, a, a thesis or a, a history graduate, not graduate, history senior seminar class that was on crime and punishment was a theme. And so I chose to write about early martyrs and how you know, why did the Roman government prosecute them legally in court? Like what, why? And so I read the story of St. Perpetua and Felicity for the first time. And that was actually, I think the semester before I became a catechumen also. So they were very instrumental um, in my conversion also. And so they were actually the first set of saints that came to mind. I thought, you know what? Their friendship was so strong that Felicity joined her um, mistress in prison 
And, you know, we can read about how they comforted each other with prayer and singing and they stayed together. You know, that's the kind of friendship I want for my kids. And so I thought, well, how can I write something, either a lesson or, or a book? And I, I talked to my husband. I said, you know, I think this could be a book, you know, God's saintly friends or saintly friends of God. And I actually got a notebook and I just kind of started sketching these stick figures <laughs> of different saints that I knew were also friends. And so, you know, I thought of St. Perpetua and St. Felicity. I thought of St. Ruth and St. Naomi. I thought of, um, I'm trying to think who some of the early ones were, um, uh, St. Cosmos and St. Damien. You know, I thought, you know, what are pair, who are pairs of saints who were friends and also did, you know, godly acts of service. I thought of, you know, Mother Maria of Paris and Father Dimitri. And so I just started kind of making this list of all these different saints who also had godly friendship or who displayed characteristics that were part of the faith. And, and pretty much I wrote them all out in one night. And then I asked my friend Abigail Holt and my priest and some other um, friends. In fact, Father Daniel Greason's wife, Chelsea, Curia Chelsea, um, I kind of emailed some friends and said, hey, do you know of any saints that were also friends or that you can think of that displayed, you know, um, virtues and friendship? And so I kind of compiled this list and I worked through it. And then I thought, you know, I, I really think this could be a board book for little ones. Um, and so I kind of started reaching out to different Orthodox publishing companies and trying to figure out, okay, how, how do I get this thing in my mind on paper? Uh, because I am not an artist. Like, let's be real. The stick figures would not have worked. Um, and so I'm like, you know, I can write these words, you know, I'm a professor, I'm a teacher. So I understand, you know, how, lesson plans work and, and how to teach things, especially to young people. And I said, but you know, I have no artistic gifts at all. Um, <laughs> and so I had reached out um, to a couple different Orthodox illustrators to see if they were interested. And then I kind of came back around um, to my friend Abigail because I had asked her advice originally on sets of saints and then at the time, she was working with Draw Near Designs Company, um, which is a, a group of um, uh, moms, uh, Orthodox mothers, uh, who also create some amazingly beautiful resources yeah, um, based out of Louisville. And, um, and so I thought she reached out to me and said, if you want me to illustrate this idea you have, I would be honored. Oh. And so I just kind of was like, yes. <laughs> So you Please. had an illustrator before you had a publisher? Yes. So we okay, went so, very non-traditional route. Yeah, I was going to say, usually people go to the publisher and then the publisher's like, okay, we've got these three illustrators who were, you know what I mean? Like, right. So you, yeah, it, so it was when just, you went to the publisher, did you have like a completely perfect book that was ready to go? And you're just like, do you want this or not? Well, I had, um, I think it was just my own ignorance, not knowing that that's right. how things go. Yeah. Um, and so I said, Abby, let's, why don't you draw up two spreads? You know, let's do two sets of saints. And so she drew up St. Patrick and St. Bridget and, um, who, oh, who's the other one? I think St. Elizabeth and St. Barbara. And so she sketched those two, you know, finished those two spreads with the words, and we submitted those um, to a couple different Orthodox publishers. And, you know, one said, you know, we like it, but we want to think about it. And then about nine months went by. And I just thought, oh, oh well, this isn't going to get published. And I really like it. And I think it's important. <laughs> and so, again, just my own ignorance and perseverance, I guess, um, I saw had seen, I think, some kind of, I don't know if it, not an advertisement, but something on my social media on Facebook popped up with Summer Kennard's picture. And it said something like, you know, new Orthodox publishing company, 
you know, opens requesting submissions. And I went to her website and one of the things on the list was board books. And I thought, you know what? I, I called Abby. I said, Abby, is it okay if I submit this to one more publisher? And she was like, yeah, you know, I've already done the illustrations. What can we lose? You know, we've gotten two no's, but you know, maybe, you know, this will be it. And so I, I sent the, the two spread proofs and the text to Summer and within 24 hours, she had responded and said, yes, I love it. Let's make it two volumes, period. I love like I'll send you the contract next week. <laughs> And so yeah, she that's just the beauty of a startup company, right? Like she doesn't yeah. have a board that has to debate right. for 15 weeks, right? right? She's just like, I looked at it. I think it's yeah, great. Her gut. Here we go. Exactly. Also, do you want to be my social media director? Let's go. Right. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That came a little later, but yeah. And so then I kind of started developing this relationship with Summer. Um, and, and, and she was the one that was like, let's make it two volumes and, and let's, make the first one about friendship and the second one about family and, and you divide it how you want to with the saints. And, and so now, um, volume two just came out in November. That's so amazing. That's just wonderful. Well, congratulations on two yeah. children's books. That's yeah, wonderful. I, I love that. And I love summer, you know, summer's publishing house, park End books. They just do great things. She does books that nobody else is doing and she, she takes risks on people and she's just neat. I, I enjoy it so much. I love summer, but yes. that, that's beautiful. So do you think you're going to write another children's book in the future? Well, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> <laughs> on May 12th, I'm la launching a Kickstarter to fund um, a new board book that's going to be illustrated by a um, Coptic Orthodox artist named Yostina Kaud, and it's called Little Steps, and it's all about the virtues featured in St. John of the Ladders, Ladder of Divine Ascent. Oh, cool. Okay, how are so, we going to find this Kickstarter in May? Yeah, so we'll be posting, um, ultimately, what we're trying to do is raise money for printing um, because printing costs have gone up and board books are especially expensive to to make. Um, and so the Kickstarter will be advertised on the Park and Books pages and also on um, my um, author's Instagram account, uh, Yostina's uh, Illustrator Instagram account. And so kind of across social media, and, um, especially and your and also account, Park and Books. Catherine Ritzke? Yes. That, is that what is, people would search? R E R E T Z K E Ritsky. Correct. Okay. Yeah, they can. Right, I want to make there. sure people can find you if they want to support that because uh, that sounds really neat. And and Catherine, thank you so much for coming on the program. This has been really a joy. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us again. And come back uh, for next Sunday night's Everyday Orthodox guest. We look forward to it. And Christ is risen.